Weird stuff permeates history but by necessity, most of the weird stuff is not taught in school, because of space and time limitations, schools have to pick and choose which historic details to teach, and which to leave out. Unavoidably that means focusing on major items, while leaving out most details, many of them fascinating. For example schools might teach that the discovery of the new world meant the introduction of new foods to the diet of the old world, like maize potatoes and tomatoes. However, schools would probably leave out that for years tomatoes were associated with werewolves, and having them in one's kitchen might arouse suspicions of fell witchcraft, following our 20 things about weird details history class failed to cover. Satanic Tomatoes The discovery and exploration of the Americas revolutionized the world in myriad ways, not least among them was the Columbian Exchange, a widespread transfer of plants, animals, peoples, cultures, technology and diseases between the old world and the new. One plant in particular turned out to be way more controversial than expected when it was initially introduced to the old world, the tomato. No other vegetable has been as maligned as the tomato, a fruit by scientific consensus, but a vegetable according to the United States Supreme Court. Following its introduction to the old world, the tomato eventually became a huge hit, revolutionizing cuisines all around the planet. However, in a weird twist on the Colombian exchange, Tomatoes were initially met with outright hostility in some parts of Europe, where they were viewed as a satanic plant. Tomatoes and Werewolves The centuries-long witch hunt craze, much of which overlapped with the age of exploration, was pretty weird in its own right. Tens of thousands of women were slaughtered, after being accused of practicing dark magic. Less known and amplifying the weirdness, is that thousands of additional men and women, were also executed around the same time, accused of being werewolves. Authorities in many parts of Europe believe that witches and werewolves were closely associated, they reason that just as witches concocted and brewed potions that allowed them to fly, they concocted and brewed potions that transformed people into werewolves. A main ingredient in that witches brew were plants that looked a lot like tomatoes. An ill-timed introduction it was not the tomato's fault that it was first imported to Europe around 1540, at a historically weird moment during the height of witch hysteria, from the 14th to mid-17th centuries, thousands of Europeans the overwhelming majority of them women, were killed as witches. Women accused of witchcraft were lynched by mobs, were hanged, crushed, drowned, or burned by courts, both secular and religious. Conservative estimates, culled from official records, put the number of executed victims in the tens of thousands. Other estimates go as high as half a million. Tomatoes arrived in Europe just when authorities were trying to figure out the ingredients of witches' flying ointment, a goop they smeared on brooms to make them fly, or on themselves to fly without a broom, that same goop could also transform whoever it was smeared on into a werewolf. In 1545 the Pope's physician, Andres Laguna, described the key ingredients as henbane, nightshade, and mandrake close botanical relatives of tomatoes. Confusing Tomatoes The weird fear of tomatoes comes across as less weird when examined in the context of the time. Tomato plants not only look like deadly nightshade, a suspected ingredient of which is magic goop, they are just about identical to the untrained eye. Similarly, some tomato varieties, such as yellow cherry tomatoes, look remarkably similar to hallucinogenic mandrake fruits, another ingredient of the witch's goop. So at a time when Europe was engulfed by hysteria surrounding anything having to do with witches, a plant that looked like an ingredient of a witch's concoction was bound to prove controversial. Even today, many people suspect those who experiment with new foods. In the 1540s, experimenting with tomatoes entailed the risk of getting turned into a werewolf, or getting accused by suspicious neighbors of practicing witchcraft. Unsurprisingly, many people decided to leave tomatoes alone. Indeed, the only place where it was safe to have them was Spain, where the Spanish Inquisition had temporarily declared that the belief in witchcraft was heretical. The Spanish and Italians eventually incorporated tomatoes into their diets wholesale, but the English and French remained in the tomatoes are demonic weird camp for a ridiculously long time, before finally relenting. The Weird White House Sheep Experiment During World War I, just about everybody in the home front tried to do their bit of declaring and signaling their support for the war effort back then. That entailed more than simply slapping a support the troops. Bumper sticker on a car. War bonds drives were organized, donations were collected from the patriotic, and scrap metal was gathered. The White House was not immune, 
and for some time starting in 1918 visitors were greeted with the weird sight of seeing the president's abode transformed into a sheep ranching operation. The idea behind raising sheep on the White House lawn was to save manpower, the sheep would trim the lawn, and the manpower thus saved could be redirected toward the war effort. The sheep performed another patriotic service, the president donated their wool to the American Red Cross, which apportioned it among the various states' Red Cross chapters. At patriotic auctions, the White House wool brought in as much as $10,000 a pound. However little did passers-by know how much of a hassle was involved in keeping the sheep on White House grounds. White House Sheep It began in the spring of 1918, when President Woodrow Wilson was motoring around the countryside with a friend, and remarked that he would like to see some sheep at the White House, it sounds a bit weird now, but it was not that weird a century ago. Wilson and his wife wanted to be the model family for supporting the war effort, and indeed over the next two years, wool sheared from the White House's sheep would yield $52,000 for the American Red Cross at auction a princely sum back then. However, it was not all smooth sailing, as a Washington Post article reported on May 12, 1918, just a few weeks into the sheep ranching experiment, President Wilson is having no end of trouble with a flock of sheep he purchased recently to graze on the White House lawn. The sheep were scared of the cars and trucks that had recently started to appear in the District of Columbia in increasing numbers. It was just the start of an ongoing sheep trauma. Scared Sheep President Wilson's White House sheep could be said to have been scared, literally, shitless, as the Washington Post described their plight, two of the sheep developed serious illness yesterday and are under the care of specialists from the Department of Agriculture. The animals had been getting along nicely until yesterday. The fact that one of the sheep has the dips is said to be due to the fact that it became frightened by passing automobiles and similar noises to which it was not accustomed. By 1920, the flock had grown to 48 sheep and had destroyed the White House's back lawn, so they were moved to the front lawn and promptly began destroying the rose gardens, prompting a frantic, fencing operation to save the flower beds and more delicate trees from the flock's depredations. By August of that year, Wilson had finally had enough and brought the weird experiment to an end. As the Washington Post put it, President Wilson has decided to retire from the sheep business. Back when Ivy League universities used to make their students pose for nudie pics, in the late 1970s, a weird event occurred when a Yale University employee unlocked a long unused room in one of the Ivy League institution's buildings. Inside was quite the surprise, thousands upon thousands of photos of nude young men, showing their fronts, sides and rears. To add to the weirdness, there seemed to be sharp metal pins sticking out of the naked men's spines. What could it be? Was it the trove of some weirdo with a niche fetish for BDSM voodoo porn? As it turned out it was nothing so juicy but was still plenty weird in its own right. Yale and other Ivy League schools had been in the habit of taking nude photos of their students. Generations of America's elites had their nudie pics snapped in the name of science. From the 1940s to the 1970s, Yale, plus some other Ivy League schools such as Harvard, Vassar, and Brown, required their freshmen to pose nude for a photo shoot. The goal of the weird requirement was to furnish material for a massive study into how rickets developed, and that involves sticking pins to the backs of the subjects, male and female. Generations of the country's elite who went to the Ivy Leagues posed for the nudie pics. The archives included the naked photos of well-known figures ranging from George W. Bush to Hillary Clinton to Diane Sawyer to Meryl Streep. The photos were burned after news leaked, and the study was denounced. However, it is possible that some might have escaped the flames and are still circulating out there, to potentially end up on the internet someday? Germany's Polar Bear Mania Frenchwoman Jean-Marie Dana has amassed a collection over the past three decades, containing more than 10,000 weird vintage photos of 1920s and 1930s Germans. The photos, which include plenty of Nazis, depict the Germans posing with men dressed up as polar bears. Polar bears became all the rage in Germany, starting in the early 1920s, when the Berlin Zoo acquired a pair of polar bear cubs. The cute new additions caught on with the public, and proved so wildly popular that the result was a mini-boom in furries and polar bear costumes. A fad with long-lasting legs For a fad the weird German polar bear craze, 
was more than just a simple flash in the pan, it went on for decades, year after year, cheerful Germans of all walks of life and ages, routinely snapped photos of themselves posing with polar bears, or folk in polar bear costumes as the country underwent radical changes. The Weimar Republic weakened and collapsed, the Nazis seized power, the Third Reich kicked off its horrors, World War II was fought and lost, Germany was occupied and partitioned, throughout it all, Germans kept up the polar bear fad. It was only in the late 1940s, that the fad finally faded. The High Seas Exterminator 17th century French buccaneer Daniel Montbars, 1645 to disappeared 1707, was weird, and not in a good way, better known as Montbars the Exterminator, he earned his nickname, and then some. One of the most feared pirates of his era, Montbars became known as the Exterminator because of the sheer bloody-mindedness and glee displayed in killing Spaniards. Montbars was born into a wealthy family, and was raised and educated in France as a gentleman, in childhood he developed a hatred of Spain and all things Spanish, based on what he read of the cruelties of the conquistadors towards the New World natives. In 1667 he joined his uncle in the French Royal Navy, and accompanied him to the Caribbean. Their Montbars' anti-Spanish sentiment grew in leaps and bounds, when his ship was sunk in a battle against Spaniards, during which his uncle was killed. His only pleasure seemed to be to contemplate a Euro-broken bar the number of dead and dying. Montbars left the French navy after his uncle's death, and headed to the pirate haven of Tortuga, an island off the Haitian coast, between his professional expertise as a naval officer, and his seething hatred of Spain, the buccaneer's main foe he was welcomed with the open arms. Before long he was captaining his own buccaneer ship. He made a name for himself as a scary weird pirate in an early action against a Spanish vessel. Montbars led the way to the decks of the enemy, where he carried injury and death, and when submission terminated the contest, his only pleasure seemed to be to contemplate, not the treasures of the vessel, but the number of dead and dying Spaniards, against whom he had vowed a deep and eternal hatred, which he maintained the whole of his life. A Caribbean Rampage Daniel Montbars went on a piratical rampage against the Spanish Main, Spain's possessions in the Caribbean, the Gulf of Mexico, and the coastal mainland from Florida to Venezuela, he raided Spanish settlements in Cuba, Puerto Rico, and Mexico. On the Venezuelan coast, he sacked and burned the towns of Maracaibo, San Pedro, Puerto Caballo, and Gibraltar, among numerous other settlements and forts. It was during this rampage that Montbars became known as the exterminator, he gave no quarter, and tortured captured Spanish soldiers. Among his more infamous and weird tortures was opening a victim's abdomen, pulling out a gut and nailing it to post, then forcing the victim to dance to his death by beating his backside with a burning log. He and his crew amassed a fortune, which they reportedly buried near Grand Saline, Texas. However, the exterminator never came back to retrieve it, he vanished in 1707 most likely lost at sea. From courtier to pirate Another weird French pirate was Jean-Francois Roberval, 1500-1560, a nobleman, adventurer, and buccaneer, Robreville began his career in the French army in Italy. There he met and befriended France's crown prince, the future King Francis I. The French royal became Robreville's lifelong pal, and a frequent guest and hunting companion on the Robreville estates. Moving in high society, hosting royalty, and living as a courtier was pretty expensive though, and it eventually drove Robreville deep into debt. In 1541 Francis I commissioned Robreville, to establish a settlement of about 500 French colonists in Canada. However, the king did not furnish his friend with the necessary funds. So to make ends meet, Roberval turned to piracy to help finance the settlement. Plundering for a good cause To help sustain the recently established French settlement in Canada, Jean-Francois Roberval became a pirate, preying upon English merchant ships, his friend and patron King Francis I enjoyed tweaking the English, but to avert open hostilities with England, he rebuked Roberval. It amounted to a wink-wink nudge-nudge slap on the wrist, and Roberval continued plundering English ships. The Canadian settlement eventually failed and the survivors were repatriated back to France. Roberval remained in the New World, however, and continued his career, now focusing on Spanish ships and possessions in the Caribbean, throughout much of the 1540s, he terrorized the Spaniards, attacking Cartagena, 
Rancheras, and Santa Marta in Colombia, plus Baracoa and Havana in Cuba. Roberval finally ended his weird experiment with piracy, retired from plundering the high seas in 1547, returned to France and converted to Protestantism. He got tangled up in France's wars of religion, and was assassinated in Paris in 1560. The Duel That Launched the Pirate When Michel de Gramont was born into a French noble family in 1650, few would have expected that the weird twists of fate that would lead the aristocratic baby into ending his days as an infamous pirate, yet that was to be the destiny of de Gramont, who terrorized the Caribbean and the Gulf of Mexico for a decade and a half. The weird radical transformation began when a 14-year-old de Gramont was angered by a French army officer who was courting his sister and challenged him to a duel. Despite his youth he won the duel and killed the officer. That got de Gramont into trouble, and he was forced to flee France. He ended up in Hispaniola and became a privateer, a pirate operating with a letter of marque from a government, authorizing him to prey upon enemy shipping in time of war. Beginning with a bang, few privateering careers got off to as spectacular a start as did de Gramont's, when he captured a Dutch fleet that included a ship, known as the Purse of Amsterdam for the precious cargo it carried, it netted him 400,000 livres, the equivalent of about $4 million today. News of that success spread and before long de Gramont was commanding his own pirate fleet. He kept his men busy, attacking Dutch and Spanish shipping and possessions. One of his most daring exploits was a successful raid on Cumana in Venezuela in 1680. It was weird just how much good fortune seemed to be on his side. He pulled off that spectacular coup despite having only 50 men, while the defenders had 2,000 soldiers and 17 ships with 328 cannons. In 1683 he sacked Veracruz, Mexico, and took 4,000 prisoners for ransom. The Gramont's depredations finally ended in 1686, when his ship was caught in a storm, and went down with all hands. The weird plan to blast NYC with Nazi submarine rockets during World War II, Nazi scientists had a weird and alarming talent for thinking outside the box and coming up with lethal technological innovations. More alarming yet was their ability to quickly transform their sinister brainstorms into practical designs, then rush them through production and get them into the hands of the German military. Fortunately, Hitler's scientists fell short when it came to World War II's greatest technological innovation of all the atomic bomb. That was good news, because the technological innovations that Nazi scientists actually came up with gave Germany's enemies more than enough to worry about. They included the vengeance weapons, such as the V-1 flying bomb, the world's first cruise missile and the V-2, the first ballistic missile. They struck fear into the hearts of the civilian populations they were deployed against. Vengeance weapons terrorized and killed thousands of Londoners, and if German military planners had had their way, they would have done the same to New Yorkers. Dreaming up missile submarines Missiles had relatively short ranges during World War II, and their reach was limited to a few dozen miles at most from launch sites on land in German-controlled territory, that left most of the territory of Germany's enemies beyond the reach of German missiles. In 1941, a plan was conceived to bring more enemy territory within reach of the Third Reich's rockets, by marrying rockets to U-boats. It was the brainchild of two weirdly innovative brothers, Friedrich Steinhoff, commander of U-511 a Type IXC U-boat, and Dr. Eric Steinhoff, who was working at the secret rocket research program at Painamunda. Equipping a U-boat with rockets would transform the submersibles into mobile launch platforms. With the high seas as their highways, U-boats could take German missiles to just about anywhere in the world, or at least anywhere in the world that lay within a few dozen miles of the seacoast. coast.